metabolism produces poison. Our metabolism produces poison as a regular feature of just day-to-day -day life. And the culprit here is protein. Because of that, we have to have a system to deal with the constant generation of protein. Specialized organs that are going to do a very hard chemical job. And that chemical job is to take a small, very potent, very reactive molecule. The molecule is ammonia. When we say an amino acid, it's because it has an amine group, NH2. Release that in water and you've got ammonia, which is converted to ammonium ion. And this is where our overall chemical uh, approach does, deserves some, some explanation. In chemistry, you're always interested in all of the effects of reactions. So, for example, we know water is a fairly good solvent in our world. We know that water is compatible with, and in fact essential to, living cells. Our solvent, in some cases a reactant, in other cases a product of our metabolism. Water is what we call neutral, pH 7, as it, as it sits in a beaker on the top of the counter. There are other materials that are much more reactive and when we talk about danger or damage, we're generally talking about the reactivity of that chemical with a, in a particular process. So for example, if you build an automobile and you're gonna burn gasoline in order to generate power, you're interested in the chemical reaction between that combustion and the combustion products with the metal that you make the engine out of. That would be an element of wear. Now, in biology, the big thing you're interested in is its effect on living cells. And this is where our standardized tests of toxicity in handy. So often now we use, because of the convenience of using microorganisms, we use microbiology to test toxicity. Or if we're particularly interested in humans, we might use human cell cultures. In any event, what you would do is you identify your test solution. Let's say we're testing ammonia. And you basically uh, create, by chemical means, a range of concentrations of ammonia solutions. Then you take a standardized cell culture drop that solution on and observe its effects on the living cells. Now we already know within the human body that we have a tolerance of a very wide array of acid conditions. In fact, if you think about our plasma pH as the starting point, 7.4, we can go to 6.4, we can go to 5.4, we can go to 4.4 very easily. Foods like tomatoes, foods like oranges, those tart foods are tart because of the acid they contain. And to go to the ultimate place in our body, the digestive tract in the stomach, we have a pH of we're created by hydrochloric acid. Now we have to cover those, the, the cells of those walls with mucus in order to maintain that, but to protect ourselves, but still, that's very, very high. That's a very, very low pH, very high acid concentration. However, when we go from 7.4 and try to raise the pH, about the most basic set point is urine, which under extreme conditions can do a pH of 8. If your blood plasma went to pH 8, you would be on the ground in convulsions. And uh, after a very short time, you would be uh, approaching death. Strong basis, universally, 
are known to have devastating effects on living cells of all kinds. That's true for human cells as well. When you look at our best disinfectants, our best cleaners, because of their effects on living cells and because of their effects on those polymers that we talked about, strong bases lead the way. So we know substances like ammonia, substances like bleach, which are bases, not the strongest chemical bases, but our bases have a tremendous cleaning and disinfecting effect on living cells. Now, as you move further, you get to something like uh, sodium hydroxide is a good example. One molar sodium hydroxide is pH 14. pH 14. And that end has devastating effects. In general, I've worked in chemistry labs of one type or another all my career, and I've been exposed to very strong acid solutions, pH 1, pH 0 and had them splashed on my skin. And in general, you rinse them off and you get a certain amount of damage. If you rinse quickly, often acids don't have an effect. But bases are different. Bases, because of their effect on living cells, they stick to your epidermis. And even if you irrigate by flushing, you wash it with soap, there's been a certain amount of uh, absorption and there's a certain amount of, of cell uh, uh, degradation that's going to occur. Things are going to start falling off. So that's kind of a long introduction to provide the prelude for the urinary system, which exists for the first function shown here, the excretion of nitrogenous waste. And that's a uh, part and parcel of our need for proteins and our need for processing protein. Because we've uh, developed a liquid system, our urine is liquid as long as it stays completely liquid. It's a solution and our urinary system works fine. But if there's a chemical or a, a cell and tissue problem that causes solids to precipitate in that system, it's extraordinarily painful and life-threatening. So when you see someone who has a kidney stone move, a kidney stone is a small piece of solid somewhere in the kidney. It moves and extremely painful. I've seen it drop people to their hands and knees. But when kidney stones are, are passed and you see them uh, recover them uh, from the urine, you basically, it surprises people. They say, well, that's just the size of a grain of sand. That's what happens when you introduce this into what should be a liquid system. But because it's a liquid system, it has an, an important effect on blood volume and blood pressure. You can deal with uh, decreasing water content, approaching dehydration, by making the most concentrated urine you can. In other words, retaining the water that's in your body. You can cope with a drinking episode and potential overhydration. So you sit down, you have those five beers in a row. And your body, body is overhydrated. What, you, what do you do? You basically just pass that out as high volumes with very, very low concentration of urine. So the urinary system is going to be involved in our water balance. It's going to regulate the chemical content throughout the body by affecting the solutes in the blood. When you play with the water balance, that osmotic pressure is going to vary. What's also going to vary with varying states of hydration is the concentration of solutes. As a result, regulation of pH, one of our important solutes, uh, is uh, involved. The kidney also is the site of production of EPO, erythropoietin, which affects the rate of uh, blood cell production, especially red blood cells, and consequently the hematocrit. Um, is sensed and regulated from the kidney. It also regulates the synthesis of vitamin D, which profoundly affects calcium levels. But these are sort of tag-ons uh, related to the fact that a lot of blood flows through the kidney. It's a good place to put those sensors. 
in the release of those uh, particular substances. But the number one job, the number one job, nitrogenous wastes. Nitrogen is in amino acids, nucleic acids from the nucleotides. It's absorbed through the digestive system um, as protein or nucleic acid traces. In the liver, this ammonia is combined with high, a mean group plus hydrogen forms ammonia, which is toxic to cells. It's converted there to the much less toxic urea. We looked at that in the previous uh, PowerPoint. Two advantages. Number one, urea concentrates the ammonia by putting two amine groups on one carbon. Number two, once you put two amine groups, it doesn't double the damage. It basically reduces it dramatically. We have a much higher tolerance of urea. And urea is released in different forms. This problem is dealt with in different ways by different organisms. Fish swim around in water. So once ammonia is produced in their body, they basically just release the ammonia into the water, carries it away. Um, in birds and reptiles, we have terrestrial organisms that actually are very concerned with water efficiency. And in selected reptiles, and in all birds, and by the way, birds, since their, their trick is flying, Body weight is very important. Carrying around a bunch of, of urea in urine, liquid form, means your body's heavier. So both of these forms have developed the ability to dehydrate the urine to the point where the urea actually crystallizes out. So that semi-paste material that birds leave around for us to clean off of our cars, if you touch it and go like that, it'll feel grainy, it'll feel gritty because of the precipitated solid form of uric acid. We make urine. All mammals make urine. And as a result, we have a certain commitment to body size for carrying that weight around. There's a great variation among the mammals, though, in their water conservation practices. So those animals like a camel, for example, which exist in areas of extreme drought but can basically go a matter of days three four five days without drinking if they began from a completely hydrated state but that's due to water conservation measures in the whole body and the ability to produce tissues which when they drink can hydrate and hold water for the body giving them an unusual uh, ability to tolerate dehydration. The kidneys, the ureters, the urinary bladder, and the urethra form the urinary system. It's a very compact system. And understand it's an extractive system. The ammonia, the urea, is being distributed around by the blood. Now, we release the ammonia everywhere by deamination of amino acids. The ammonia and the urea are produced in the liver. It enters the general circulation. So if you think about it, there's a urea pool flowing around your body right now. We have a partial processing plant, the kidneys, and you can see them here uh, relative to their position on the descending aorta. Because of the size of these renal arteries, about 30% of this descending blood flow, which is a lot of flow in the body, is shut it off into the kidney for a high pressure processing that will remove urea. And that removal is sufficient to maintain the urea in the blood within its homeostatic safety range. So the processing is a liquid system processing occurring completely here in the kidneys. After the kidneys, you have only transport and holding in the system. So ureters will push the urine to the bladder where it is accumulated. When the bladder gets close to full, we release the urethra to allow urine to pass from the body. Let's take a look at this process. Um, 
The organ system first. The renal artery shown here is a large diameter. It is short and it's coming from the descending aorta. Basically, at the level of the descending aorta that is right below the heart. So it's high pressure. And that high pressure delivers a large flow of blood for the um, uh, relative to the size of the kidneys. The adrenal glands are shown on top of the kidneys and their position kind of slightly offset. The right kidney is typically a little lower than the left kidney. Each of them is partially uh, protected by these uh, false ribs, the ones that have no costal connections around to the front. But uh, one of the things we notice about the kidneys is that they're very delicate. You know, in boxing, you can hit people anywhere above the waist. If, if a boxer doesn't protect himself, you can hit him in the throat. That's a legal, legal um, blow, although it seldom uh, occurs since the boxer protects his throat. But if he, let's say he misses you and it spins him around, you cannot hit him in the kidneys. The kidney punch is illegal because a force of a punch delivered by an average man like myself, if I punch you square in the kidney, you can damage the kidney enough that you will die and it will be a extended and painful death. They're delicate. So we not only find this partial protection by its low placement in the retroperitoneal space and its protection by these uh, ribs, but the floating ribs especially, but we find fat packed around the kidney. And I want to mention this. We always think about fat for energy storage, but as we get lower and lower and lower energy storage in our bodies, we become you know, very gaunt, approaching malnourished. We do find that fat is retained in some regions. Uh, for instance, in the synovial joints as packing and cushioning. Another place where we'll find fat retained is here around the kidney or cushioning. The kidney is shown in long section here as consisting of zones. This kidney is covered with a fibrous capsule, which makes the outside stretchy and pliable, but impermeable. And within it, we see two zones. This light colored zone that's running right inside the capsule, shown by this arrow, is called the cortex of the kidney. This is where blood is distributed to the beginning or entry point of the functional unit. That functional unit is going to be called the nephron. Can't be seen at this magnification. Within this cortex, and it just looks like a kind of an outer C-shaped circle, but realizing that in the three-dimensional uh, kidney, it's basically just inside the capsule on all surfaces. Then there's a row, and that row is a circular, a semicircle here, of kind of cone-shaped structures. You can see them here as triangles. This triangular structure is called a medulla. But if you look at it three-dimensionally, the walls penetrating the kidneys and the walls sticking out are kind of circular. So this is a big kind of open circle at the top, but like a funnel, tapers down to this pinched end at the bottom. This renal medulla occurs uh, in triangular form in this section with these interstitial spaces, the columns, separating them. But we still recognize this region that consists largely of the medulla. Uh, uh, individual pyramids. The medulla is the collective name for all of these individual pyramids. Now the processing is going to work the blood vessels that come in are going to split and go to all parts. You can see them diagrammed here. The arteries are pushing blood flow through the columns out to this cortex, where the entry points to literally millions of little nephrons will be placed. 
the blood is divided up on the level of capillaries to the nephrons and processed. The nephron is going to basically process by receiving blood from the blood vessel here, dipping in to the medulla, coming back out, and then joining to a thing called a collective duct. Now, the collective duct from all the nephrons across the top of this pyramid will basically run in parallel down to the very base, that open place of the funnel, and drip the urine into these carrying tubes. Now, this tube, by the way, the hilum, is this indentation in the kidney where the ureter enters. Up here we have the ureter goes to the renal pelvis, this large collection area that splits into these smaller tubes. This would be called a major calyx, a minor calyx, you can just see it's a converging tube system. So if we're looking at this medulla, we're going to drip the urine out here. Here's another minor calyx that's going behind the plane of this figure into the material and to basically to a uh, medulla that's located uh, across uh, uh, on the uh, far surface of the kidney, delivering its urine from the different medulla and they basically, they're just running together right here, collecting in the pelvis, and eventually entering the top of the ureter. In very small amounts, the ureter is going to have a muscular contraction, peristalsis. So two or three drops collect here, and peristalsis pushes that straight to the bladder. Notice the fat for cushioning and packing of this delicate organ, because we're basically going to be working on a liquid basis. Now, why is it so delicate? It's delicate because the parts, the nephron is so small. It has to be small. We're carrying a very reactive and deadly chemical in among all of our electrolytes, in among all of our valuable stuff like glucose, like nutrients, the oxygen and the CO2 that's circulating through the blood is all right there. And there's the urea floating around among them. In addition, we have the blood cells that are bringing this material in. We don't want to lose blood cells. Uh, we don't want to lose those valuable metabolites or molecules. We want to retain those. But at the same time, it's, it's actually fairly chemically, it's tough to pull something so reactive and so small out from this huge mix of solution. But the kidney's gonna do that job. And the way it's gonna do it is by chemical means using transport of molecules and osmosis. And since we're going to basically form and concentrate by osmosis, we're going to have to have a lot of membrane surface area. So the nephron is tiny smaller, and its tubes are smaller than a capillary. That gives us tremendous processing area. So when we look further into the kidney, here's an actual kidney. Now you'll notice something about preservation, how it shrinks the root tissue down part of preservation, keeping it from decomposing or growing bacteria is to dehydrate it. And what you can see here is the ureter, the so-called renal pelvis, and the calyx, major and minor, leading up to the base. But this pointer is right at the base of a pyramid. That pyramid is more cone-shaped, but both names are pretty descriptive. Up here, you notice the minor calyx running to a collecting point from one, two, three of these pyramids, all kind of bringing their urine to this central point where they go minor calyx, major calyx, and renal pelvis on their way to the ureter. But definitely, even in this dehydrated state, you can kind of see without the color of our figures and our artists helping us out, the medulla still does look definitely darker in color 
than the surrounding cortex. So let's try to relate this anatomy to the delivery of blood first. Here's the renal artery, high pressure entry and the splitting. Notice how those splitting arteries basically fan out in this section and basically are delivering blood up through the columns between those pyramids to an array of processing units that are in this cortex. Now this cone here has been blown up here to show you what's happening out here in the cortex. Here are the arteries up at the top of the pyramid running kind of in a semi-circular fashion, kind of a curving fashion, delivering blood to all of these little towers of arteries. And arterial blood, enriched blood, meaning it's enriched in urea as well as enriched in oxygen and nutrients, ascends these little arteries and delivers blood to these golden globes. These are called the glomerulus or glomerular capsule, and they represent the start of one nephron. So if you, if you follow the blood in from the left, up this tower to here, it flows into the glomerulus, where we're going to do a, a step called filtration. We're gonna take out as much urea as we can, but we're also going to, in that process, filter out a lot of useful things. All of the ions are small enough, they get filtered out. Things like glucose come out. Things like some hormones are with the initial filtering. The remaining blood, which has the large proteins and the cells flows out, I'm sorry, out, and basically forms this vessel network around the loop that comes out of the glomerulus. So the blood is basically going to have a chemical role down here in the medulla before it returns to this vein network. And the vein basically is gonna carry it to this larger vein, which follows the same path out. So from here, you're gonna flow out of this vein down between the pyramids to these larger veins, the renal vein, which will return the blood that's gone through the kidney to the inferior vena cava. So that's the basics of blood flow. As I said, about 30% of the blood is flowing in this way. And to blow this up even further, I'm going to extract one of these processing units. Every place you see a globe, and there are 12 of them here, those yellow balls, that's the glomerulus, the starting point of one nephron. Now we're going to, in our figures for the text and for the lab book, draw this in a kind of an isolated way, showing you all the parts. In real life, the glomerulus gives, line, gives rise to a, a, a wiggly tubule called the proximal convoluted tubule. Then this long nephron loop that dip, dips into the medulla then we're up here, and the same, this nephron that started here is now a distal convoluted tubule as it connects to a collecting duct, which is going to run right down through the pyramid. This nephron and its spaces has well separated chemical steps for retaining the urea and some other use so that the ur urine is forming out here, but for reclaiming all of the useful nutrients and cofactors that are small enough and water that is uh, presented in the initial uh, filtering. So the anatomy of the neuron starts with this glomerulus. Now this is basically a capsule that surrounds a, a what, what amounts to a capillary network. When the blood flows in, there's something that looks like a big fancy ribbon on a on a Christmas gift. Here's what it looks like over here. The afferent arterial is bringing blood in and splits it up through these very special capillaries. Now this is with the capsule removed. I want you to notice over here, the capillaries are this knot of, uh, of blood vessels in the center, but it's surrounded by, 
nucleomerular capsule. Um, this knot of capillaries is pushed by blood pressure and in flowing through the glomerulus, it eventually converges on this efferent arteriole. That's what's showing you withdrawing this blood from the capillary, but then forming this net of exchange capillaries that surround the nephron loop. We'll return to the reason for that in just a moment. Once it flows through this whole system, the blood, and by the way, I'm not talking about the urine here, I'm talking about the blood. The blood will re-enter the vein system and be uh, basically taken out of the kidney. So here is the glomerular capsule. And what happens here is the separation of the initial filtrate. I'll explain that more in a moment. Here in the glomerular capsule, the incoming flow encounters capillaries that are very special. You see those squiggles? Those squiggles are not the normal capillary walls. What they are are special exposed basal membranes or epithelium with tiny holes, actual holes. So as the blood goes in there, anything that's smaller than those holes gets pushed out. So water comes out, not all of the water, but some, and it collects in this space inside the capsule. But in addition to water, urea gets pushed out. Along with that, anything smaller than urea or around the same size. So when I say electrolytes, I'm talking about sodium, potassium, chloride, magnesium, calcium, all those things we work to maintain in a homeostatic range. But also things like glucose. It, the holes are big enough, glucose can come out here. And other monosaccharides, amino acids can come out. So this initial filtrate is a combination of the urea you want and the small molecules that you wish to keep. However, the larger molecules, for example, albumins, the proteins of the blood, albumin, if you remember, maintains osmotic balance, too big, it doesn't come out. Um, larger uh, molecules like nutrients, if you have polysaccharides or if you have proteins, in the blood circulating, they do not come out. And all of the blood cells, including the um, uh, platelets, are retained. And so they flow out to the efferent arteriole and basically leave the urine producing side of the nephron. Before I go on, I wanna point out some more things about the anatomy. This is the entrance and you know, this is high pressure, so it's being produced all the time, and the pressure pushes it out into this proximal convoluted tubule. Look at the protrusions there that are increasing the membrane surface area. Over here, right next to where the blood goes into the glomerulus, is the juxta glomerular complex, a perfect place to sense the condition of the blood as it flows by. So, uh, one of the things that is sensed here is oxygen. If oxygen content drops, EPO is released, and EPO will dial that red blood cell production up. Uh, we also will uh, really sense water balance and osmotic pressure here. And if we do that successfully, we may change our water retention or water release parameters from the urine we're producing. So that's the glomerulus. And it is where we're going to filter the urine. To do the path, blood flow into the glomerulus produces the filtrate and the urine's going to go this way. The blood's going to come back out and go this way. The parts of the nephron are the proximal convoluted tubule. As long as it's wiggling back and forth, that's the PCT. The nephron loop consists of a descending loop. This is where you're going down into the pyramid. 
It turns the corner and comes right back out. The ascending loop, when it starts to wiggle, you're in the DCT or distal convoluted tubule. Eventually, the DCT attaches to a collecting duct. And notice every nephron doesn't have its collecting duct. Here are cut ends, one, two, three, from other nephrons that are close packed around it. So we're drawing this in a kind of an extended, spread out version. So you can see all the parts. But actually, if you squeeze it down, imagine a tube, something like a, you know, the tube in toilet paper, but much, much more narrow diameter. And you pack all those parts in. And then you put another tube right next to it and another tube. That's kind of how the nephrons are held together. There is a connective tissue network for their support because these are very delicate. These are all capillaries, basically. And these are tiny, tiny tubes for the production and retention of urine. And so basically these uh, nephrons are going to be uh, packed in together in very close array, uh, to making use of all available space. So those are the parts of the nephron, and each is going to have its chemical job. We call this the glomerulus. These are called the peritubular capillaries. Now here's where your root roots come in. Peri means around the outside, like perimeter. Tubular means the nephron tube. So these are the blood vessels around the nephron tube. This is the renal artery delivering blood. This is the renal vein carrying it back away. We do notice that there's a definitely a physical structure. If we think about this line right here as the junction between the cortex and the medulla or the pyramid in singular case, that junction defines the difference between a cortical nephron where the glomerulus is way high up here toward the outer rind or covering and the nephron loop only dips in a tiny bit into the medulla, cortical nephron, and a juxtamedullary nephron. Now, its positioning, you'll notice, is right next to the border. And so its nephron loop goes way, way down and way back out before it connects to its collecting duct. Now, these provide different um, uh, urine processing uh, potentials, or let's let's say it differently, a range of urine concentration, because we're going to basically pump ions out into this uh, medulla, so that as you move down through it, the osmotic pressure changes and water is drawn out. So the deeper you go, the more concentrated the urine can be made. Now, we're going to regulate that. And it doesn't matter if you're sitting there drinking beer after beer on a Friday night. If you've had 10 beers, your kidney's going to basically be shunting that water out as fast as it can. However, if you're out walking and you didn't bring enough water and it's a hot, humid day, you're losing a lot of water to sweat. Your, your body's going to be shutting down and making less and less more concentrated urine. And that's where these deep parts of the pyramid come into play. The circulation of the cortical nephron is just repeated here. We've already made all of these point, points flow into the glomerulus and back out to the peritubular capillaries and eventually extracting through the veins. Urine processing begin here in the, um, in the uh, glomerulus, going to the proximal tube, sorry, here, descending through the nephron loop, coming back through the distal tube. Notice it goes behind there eventually going to the collecting duct. Notice how when you wind these around each other, you form a kind of a tubular shaped nephron, which is a little broader at the top and a little narrower at the bottom, kind of reflecting that pyramid shape that we find, uh, that conical shape that we find in the pyramids of the medulla. The juxta uh, medullary nephron is even more tightly intertwined, but you see it's kind of its columnar shape. 
So it's going to be possible to pack these together, pack these together in very, very close way. The walls of these processing tubes are one cell thick. We saw that when we talked about the renal tubules in the tissue chapter. And uh, we saw the simple cuboidal walls where the cuboidal layer of the epithelium formed both the outer wall and the inner wall. So this is very, very uh, high surface area uh, structural arrangement allowing for the maximum processing of individual molecules. Now, there are three processes in urine formation. In the glomerulus, you have only filtration, and that's based only on the size of the holes in the pressure. So you're going to push all the little molecules out and retain some of them as you flow along out of the glomerulus. The filtration occurs only at this head end of the nephron. As you reach the other areas, the proximal tubule, the nephron loop, the distal tubule, and the collecting duct, you're going to have complementary processes of reabsorption. Now, in reabsorption, you are reclaiming valuable things from the filtrate. So you're taking it from the filtrate, the urine that's being formed, and putting it back in the bloodstream. That's the purpose for one purpose for the paratubular capillaries. The other purpose is uh, the process of secretion where you're able to remove some things from the blood and put them into the urine. So, for example, in situations where you have a low pH, lots of acid in the blood, you can actually transport that into the urine and make the urine more acid uh, for its removal from the body. We'll look at that again later. So, this is a wonderful place to stop. We've done the overview and the three steps. We've given the anatomy of the nephron, glomerulus, proximal, tubule, nephron loop, distal tubule, collecting duct, and we've given the overview and the processes we're going to have to identify and localize. Filtration, reabsorption, and secretion. So the perfect thing to do today is to stop our broadcast and resume with greater detail uh, on uh, the lecture following our test.